Are you interested in gaining a fresh perspective on food and how it impacts our bodies and minds? Do you wish to explore nutritious recipes and receive informative handouts on making healthy food choices, understanding the nutritional benefit of nuts and seeds and more? Marion Reinson, the executive director of Eating for Your Health, a nonprofit organization based in Princeton, New Jersey, is dedicated to bringing nutrition knowledge from clinical settings to the kitchen where real transformation takes place. She's here to provide you with the knowledge and empowering you, empowerment you seek. Well, that's awesome. Um, I'm a big believer in the in the food thing, uh, only because I've had, um, let's just say, not very good food habits in the past. Okay, all right. Well, it's... <laughs> and, so, uh, um, and I think I think it's a constant battle okay. because uh, for some reason, um, salt and sugar seems to be tasty, and that's bad for us. So I, I tend to, you know, I, I tend to be one of these people that has to fight all the time. Like, so I'm like, uh-oh, all you know, right. so... Anyway, maybe well, you can we'll help me out. Maybe, maybe you can help that. me with my power. So I guess we'll start off by telling me, I, I guess everybody, what I've found when anybody gets into like something really like good for you, they usually have a story behind that because anything I've done that tends to be good for me, there's usually a part of my life that, are, there, that I go, oh, I better go do that now. <laughs> or, okay. or I saw somebody else or I see, you know, some inspiration. So what got you into this? And tell us a little bit like why you're really focused on why this is important. Okay. So I think part of it is curiosity. Part of it is just really looking at, over the years, raising a family and looking at what does it take to make a healthy human Mm -hmm. and um, really struggling with the need for there to be convenience and quick food, but also food that really fuels your body and your brain. And um, when my kids were younger and I was, um, actually my, my younger son, was playing Pop Warner football where you have to make weight, right? He was uh. always played up, always, always, always big for his age, always played up. Got to a point where if he didn't make the weight, he was going to play two levels up, and that wasn't going to happen. You so might get hurt. Well, he, he was not going to play two levels up. So <laughs> okay. that was just, you know, so yeah, I said, well, let's, <laughs> let's really look at it. And, and you right. know, they don't drive. They don't right. shop. It's up to me to really figure out what are they going to be putting in their body. Right. So I really took a look at, at how we were eating, what we were eating, and made some changes to just um, have more whole food ingredients and, and cooking more, but in, you know, in a simple way. I'm not a chef, I'm a cook, but it has to be delicious. So started doing that and then had lunch with a friend of mine and we were having these delicious salads and talking about how it's great to have food and it's sometimes salads that somebody else makes are so much more delicious than what we make. And then she asked me if I had if I knew Dorothy Mullen, and I said no. And she said, "Do you know suppers?" And I said, "No." And she said, "Well, you need to know both." So she said, "You go to this lunch and you help cook, or you help clean, and, and you cook together and you eat together, and and it's great." So I was like, "All right, I'll try it." So I went and you know did this, you know did, was there for lunch. It was a little weird, you know, and I'm like, okay, it's kind of cool, but a little weird, but I get it. And, you know, but really everything and everything on that table was a whole food ingredient and everything from, you know, the salmon that that really fuels your your brain with the um, omega-3 fatty acids that a lot of the, you know, those cold um, seafood brings you like all these different things. And, And I was fascinated, but I didn't really have like an hour and a half or two hours in the middle of my day to be going to these things. Right. Then I saw that there was going to be a kraut making workshop. So I was like, ooh, sauerkraut. I like sauerkraut. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I said, let me go to the sauerkraut workshop. So I went to the workshop. And not only was it about making sauerkraut, it was about fermented foods. It was about knife skills. And it was about gut health. And I really didn't have any kind of knowledge about gut health. My background is not in health and nutrition. It's in marketing and strategic planning. So, but I was interested, I was curious, and I learned a lot in just this one session and made my own sauerkraut, which was something that I didn't know that I was going to be doing. Right, cool. And, um, and then started uh, a, a um, gardening program that the founder, uh, Dorothy Mullen, was running from her home garden for six months. It was once a month, and we would you know work in her garden, which was absolutely an amazing place to be. And um, I learned a lot about not only the fruits and vegetables that we eat, but the herbs and spices that we eat, and right. really how all of these whole food ingredients really do fuel our body and our brains. Started working with Dorothy, asking her if she needed any help with the organization, started working on 
um, building the, uh, the the basically the inventory of what it would take to run the organization and help her put together a strategic plan. Worked on that with her for about a year and a half, really getting granular in how the organization was run. And Dorothy, I say, was an amazing human because she passed away yeah. in March of 2020. But we would be creating an inventory of what it would take to run a program. And for her, it would be three hours. For a normal human, it would be about six hours. So, wow. so we would put together, we put together all this information, and um, and then Dorothy was diagnosed. Well, I was also on the advisory board, and then they, then I served on the board. And then Dorothy was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer oh in April of 2019, stopped delivering the programs that she was doing in June of 2019. And she was delivering about 90% of what, what we were what we did. But mm -hmm. for the last year and a half, I had worked with her and Dorothy had worked with other people, you know, interestingly enough, to really gather all the information about what it takes to run this organization if she wasn't there running it. So we, we looked at what the future would be and um, at that time, I was just coming off of um, five years I'd been working with a Columbia Business School professor named Rita McGrath. Mm -hmm. And Rita is, she's, uh, has, she lives both in New York and here in Princeton Junction, but um, working with her on her marketing and, um, and developing some courses, her, you know, helping her to develop some online courses and, and programs. And her focus was innovation and growth strategies mm -hmm. during times of uncertainty. Wow, that's good timing. <laughs> so I felt like <laughs> for the last five okay. years, I was real, you know, immersed in that space. And here we were in this such uncertain time. And, and I was just getting back into my own consulting practice, and I didn't have the stable of all these clients that I was working with. So I said, this would be a time that I could actually help to lead this organization half time mm -hmm. and then do my consulting work the other half time. So that's what I did. I put a, together a proposal for the board and said, you know, I really feel like I have the skill set to to uh, to lead this organization through this time, um, you know, and and just uh, we didn't want to see it die right. with Dorothy. Sure. So Fiona Capstick was the board chair at the time. And she and I put our heads together and said, "Let's make this live on. Let's let's continue the legacy that that Dorothy had started, which it was meeting together, cooking together, eating together, and learning together. So at that time, everything that we did was in person. Okay. And we would you almost always cook whenever we can, or have a cooking demo. Um, always having something to taste because tasting your way to healthy eating is what really oh absolutely it, it works much better than than talking about it mm -hmm. so we were doing that and then realized that we really needed to focus on some new curriculum that was um, all evidence-based and a lot of the work that um, Dorothy had been building upon was a counseling model mm -hmm. it was based on a 12-step program was really effective, but when I started looking at the resources that we had to deliver programs, realized that we really would need some licensed clinical social workers to do that kind of work. Right. And so we pivoted to uh, a consulting model, a, a coaching model. So really creating curriculum about the why we eat. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people have become disconnected with the reason why we eat. I eat because I get hungry. Right. Right. And, and I like it. Uh, and I, uh, right. But as humans, right? Oh, okay. Oh, oh there's it's like the whole too? human thing. You know, we eat because we need to fuel our bodies and our brains. Oh, that too. Right. And when we don't, mm -hmm. we get cravings to sure. eat some other things that your brains would think would have nutritional value. Sugar is what you know, every carb that we eat, which is everything but your animal proteins mm -hmm. and your fats. Everything else is a carb mm -hmm. that gets converted to sugar. And when we're eating food products that don't really have nutritional value, but still taste sweet, our brain thinks it's getting nutrition, right. but it doesn't. So it tells you to eat again. Yeah, it didn't get the anything. famous sugar, sugar soda, the sugar water, right? Yeah, yeah, or sugar and everything, just sugar and everything. So, so we, we really looked at that curriculum and um, also realized that we were kind of we needed to kind of put a pause on the programs and this was 
January, February of 2020, mm-hmm. and then COVID hit. So we were able to hit a pause button, like the rest of the world right. hit a pause button, and worked on building a new curriculum and a new model um, of the Eating for Your Health program. And that was the suppers programs. We moved over to a new brand of Eating for Your Health because that really explains what we do. So we just started um, building curriculum about around the why we eat, and that is to fuel our bodies and our brains. Well, that, that's really awesome. We're going to take a quick break because we're going to, I know that's a great time to pause because the whole world paused for a little bit. It's so it. we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Master Your Finances. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finances. And uh, we're talking about like good nutrition here with Marion and Reinson. And um, interesting, I know, you know, the, when the founder, Dorothy, passed away, who I met years ago, I remember when she first started the organization and she did a, a, a chamber event and she had us all in. And I was like, this is really awesome. Um, the food's fantastic and I love it. And one of the things that I always hear about and it happens to me a little bit personally is like, this is really good, but I don't really have time for all this stuff. Right. So um, we all want to do it. And uh, I know we paused for COVID, quote unquote. So we got a couple of things to talk about here. One is I want to just maybe that's I know we a lot happened during that period. We all like paused and had thought about a lot of things mm-hmm. during those, that, that period of time. So I guess one is. How do you address the fact that people say, I'd love to eat better, but going through the drive through and getting something that was just fried like 30 seconds ago mm-hmm. um, is pretty good and it makes me happy for the next couple minutes, but then I feel really groggy and I can't like keep, keep my eyes open an hour later because it's like weighting me down right. in ways it really shouldn't be. And it's right. not really nutritious as we know a lot of this stuff is not uh, when it's, you know, 90% like fat and 10%, you know, maybe 2% like lettuce and whatever else it's, is yeah, in there. It's, it's, it's like, it, I would say it's not nutrient dense. <laughs> not, 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 that's, a, that's a kind <laughs> way of saying it. But um, I do remember when I had the stuff that she laid out, which you point out, it was like, this is really delicious. Yeah. In fact, some of the best meals I've ever had were all were very good for you. Right. But right. it was like, wow, this is real. Well, yeah, but a gourmet cook can do that, and that's easy for them. And so, how do we address that societally? Because it's not just for like anybody who's kind of, you know, can go out and pretty much order and get what they want. Right. But also, yeah. you have to deal with the people who are a lower like socioeconomic range, sure. where they tend to buy things because it's cheap to produce these things that are not nutrient dense. Right. Right. It's cheaper. It's so, cheap. So how do we how do we address these things? The time, and then okay. the fact that. Sometimes people feel it's more expensive. Sure, sure. So when it comes to your healthy eating, um, we know that planning is everything. If you don't have the food to eat in your house, it's not going to happen. If you haven't found a source of of convenience food that's also nutrition, it's not going to happen. I keep emergency nuts and seeds in my car for those times when I'm like, oh my goodness, it's two o'clock. I really haven't eaten much. And there's, I don't have any time for much of anything, but I will open up the the um, nuts and seeds that I have and, and grab a handful of almonds or right. any other nuts and seeds. And, and it's going to hold me over till I can eat something real. And it's, if you look at the nutritional label of nuts and seeds, it basically reads like a vitamin. I there's love just, nuts and seeds. There's I, I, so many I, I think good, they're fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you get your proteins, you get your fiber, you get all a lot of your IUMs, which is, right. you know, the your magnesium, your calcium, your potassium, all of that, you know, I just call them the IUMs. Yeah, I like to eat pistachios in the shell because they have to take me time. Right. So I figure the longer it takes me to eat it, the sure. less I'm probably going to eat. Well, <laughs> like I have to unwrap every but, one of them. But it's all right because but we also That's psychological about, for purely. If, if, if it works for you, <laughs> that's, that's well, if it works for you, then yeah, it right. works. But you can yep. eat a lot of almonds. A, a, right. a, an ounce of almond is, is about 24 almonds, 23, 24 right. almonds. And that's a lot of almonds. Like right. if you eat that many, you're going to be full, and you're going to be yeah, full no, for a I while. Yeah, no, I agree. I eat a lot of fruit. I eat a lot so, of nuts, so I agree. So, with you 100%. so people do say to me, "Well, but the calories. There's a lot of calories in these, you know, in almonds. So I might as well right. just go get a Big Mac." And I'm like, "No, a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie." Right. So that's what we look at. We also we make the assumption, also based on the coaching model and the integrative health model, that people really do want to do what's best for themselves most of the time. Mm-hmm. But again, if you're not planning and if you haven't thought it through, then healthy eating isn't going to come easily unless you have somebody who's kind of doing it for you. But what we do know is that 
in the U.S., we have the standard American diet, which the acronym is SAD. So. And, and it and it <laughs> I'm is. I'm going to ask you, what is the standard American diet? It's. It, does that have Does that have golden arches on it? It. it you know, it has a <laughs> Not lot. Not to pick on McDonald's. Of, so processed processed foods, right? So it's a lot of. And so that's one of the things that we talk about. We don't talk about different eating styles except to really look at the processed foods that you're eating. Yeah. Those white flours, those white sugars, yeah, every single time biggie. that you know, the the. Um, you know, hyper-processed foods. So every time a food is processed, it loses a little bit of its nutritional value. Right. So when these foods are hyper-processed, there's really nothing, no nutritional value left. Yep. It's really cheap, and it's making people a lot of money. True. So when you're choosing to eat that way, you're really not feeding yourself. Mm -hmm. You're putting something in your, your stomach, but it's not really feeding you. So oftentimes you're going to be hungry within a short amount of time versus when you eat a meal that has the fiber, has the protein, has the healthy fats and the nutrients that you need, you're not thinking about eating again right. for, for three or four hours. And that's the point of eating. Like that's the point I of agree, eating. I agree, 100%. Is to eat and not be hungry again. But when we're on the standard American diet and we're eating things like waffles and pancakes and bagels and muffins for breakfast, you're going to be hungry again. Right. Or you're going to be really tired. Agree. Because you get that, that sugar you know, the, 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 um, the sugar roller coaster. So choosing those foods that keep your blood sugar stable, keep you full longer is actually, you know, really th that's the value meal, right? That's right. what's keeping you full. You're not hungry looking for something else in another hour and a half. And when there's not, when you look at the nutrition label, and there's all these words that you don't understand. They're, you don't recognize them as food because they're not. Right. It's up to our body to eliminate that from our body. Yeah, if it's not in English, it's probably not good for you. Probably not. <laughs> if, the, right. if, if it comes word, out of a lab. If the word's more than 20 characters, it's probably not good for you. If you don't <laughs> recognize it as food, you know what? It's not. It's probably not. not. And then our kidneys and our livers need to filter it out. So you're yeah, really true. taxing your system. And we do have an ep epidemic in this country of, of type 2 diabetes. Yep. A lot of uh, starch-related diseases. Your IBS, your celiac, um, your you know, there, there's you know yeah. just a, a whole a whole so, slew of new diseases that we didn't have 50 years ago. I know what I did, but I'm going to ask you this question generically. Like, but I, I had a really poor diet for a while, and then I switched. So I I'm, I fully agree with everything you're saying. But one of the one of the struggles that I had initially was. Well, I'm used to having a bagel every morning for breakfast. I'm used to having, you know, a Big Mac for lunch, and I'm used to having this for dinner. I'm used to having this. Yeah. And I'm used to my routine. You get into a habit. Sure. Right? So it becomes more, not that you're necessarily hungry, but, oh, it's 1130, it's time to do this. Right. Oh, it's 330 or 5 o'clock, it's time to do this. It's time to do this. And you get into this routine, and I found that difficult to break. Um, and I'll tell you how I did it, but I'm curious about what you, what kind of strategies you offer to people to say, okay, I know I shouldn't be eating these things in the morning, but I'm hungry, and that helps me, and it gets me to my next level, whatever, right. lunch or dinner, whatever the case is, right? Whatever my sure. current habits are. Sure. So how do I start breaking? You can't, my feeling is you can't break them all. Like no. You can't change 100% overnight nope. because you're going to be miserable. Right. So what do, you, what do you recommend? So we one of our pillars is called how you feel is data. So when you eat something, uh -huh. and really so if you become mindful about what you're eating how you're eating, when you're eating. And we ask people to start doing experiments with themselves. Eat certain things for your first meal of the day and see how it works for you. See how it makes you feel. Do you feel alert? Do you feel tired? Are you hungry in an hour? What works for you? And again, just because it's what we have been kind of programmed to eat here in this country doesn't mean that we need to eat those breakfast foods. Right. So. Uh, you know, I really, I've never really been a breakfast food person. When I was growing up, I would drive my mother crazy. We came to, you know, an agreement that I would have like a half of an English muffin with a piece of cheese on it because I didn't really oh, want any you breakfast. You like to fast for breakfast. Well, huh? I just, yeah. I'm not, you know, so, so no, you know, but it's, it's just, it's just the way that my body works. Right. Yep. So we also look at nutritional harm reduction, which is, like you said, if you, nutritional harm reduction. Nutritional. Nutritional harm, harm reduction. reduction. Okay. So harm reduction is a term that is used in the, um, in the addiction world moving people away from those um those substances that are harmful gotcha and the foods that we eat that are filled with 
processed ingredients and filled with mm-hmm. the sugars are harmful to us. Right. So we ask people to just make small changes, little incremental changes to subtract those foods that aren't really fueling your body and your brain and maybe adding a few that are. It might be adding, you know, having a handful of berries in the morning, eating an apple instead of the cookie, um, you know, having a whole grain product instead of the white bread product. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just really looking at different ways to feed yourself that works for you because what works for me and what works for you might be completely different. Right. I might be fine with having oatmeal with a, you know, a, a spoonful of nut butters and but for you you want, you know, eggs with vegetables or, you know, wh- whatever it, it is that works for you, just pay attention to what works for you. Right. And you don't have to be listening to what you know, we've kind of been told over the years that you need to have a breakfast of, you know, whatever this American breakfast looks like, because it really is is not bacon and eggs. Well, I mean, bacon and eggs. You know, <laughs> we also say if you can recognize <laughs> for what it was, and... what it was in, you know, in in nature, right? right. It's it's you know closer to it's not right. so processed. So eggs are a great protein. Yeah. I love eggs and whole eggs, not egg whites. Whole right. eggs. They've got me the, too. I love the eggs fat. too. They they're cheap. They're versatile. Mm-hmm. And they've they've got so B vitamins. They've got um, selenium, which is really important for our immune system. If you eat two eggs, that gives you like fifty percent of the, your daily allowance of selenium. So don't don't skimp on on the eggs. Eat Def- the whole egg. Won't skip on the eggs. We're gonna take another quick break now. You're listening to Master Your Finances. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finance. I'm here with Marion Reinson, and we're uh, talking about food. And um, how I guess the, it's incremental changes, right? Incremental so change. it's just a matter of doing little things. And I, I guess two things that I personally did that helped me. Um, one was what I started doing is I just started buying more good food, yeah. and I didn't. I ate the same amount of bad food originally, and so I felt fuller. And then eventually, I go, well, I'm really full because I ate like three bananas or whatever it was, you right, know. And then right. so I said, then I started eating those first, right. And then I started being more full, and then I started eating. I still ate it, but I would eat less. Right. Like instead of two bagels, maybe I had one bagel. Right. So I just started off by tailing, by adding the good stuff on the end yeah. as kind of like the dessert or the extra, because then I felt like, oh, I still had my normal meal. But over time, I started realizing, then I started, because my because what I found very interesting is my taste started to change. Exactly. I became much more sensitive to sugar. Mm-hmm. Like now, if you give me like a triple dark chocolate cake with whatever on it, mm-hmm. I'll actually like, it'll like shock my system because yes. and before, like 10 years ago, I'd have been like, give me another slice, you right. know? Right. Um, but it's very different. And the other thing that I did that helped me a little bit is sometimes when I'm hungry, I realize that I'm actually just thirsty. Mm-hmm. So what I'll do is drink like a glass of water and wait five minutes and say, well, am I, am I really still hungry? Right. <clears throat> and maybe half the time I am and other half I'm really not. Right. And so that just slows me down a little bit because... Um, and I started actually doing what you said is like, oh, it's, it's whatever, eight o'clock. I'm I'm supposed to eat breakfast and I'll actually ask myself, am I actually hungry? Right. And sometimes I'm yes. And sometimes it's no. And I'm like, well, I'll just wait till 10 and see how I feel at 10. Right. And so I'll just delay and, and listen to more about like how I'm feeling right then. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not always your body doesn't work on the exact same clock every day is what I personally found. Absolutely. Right. It it does vary. Like sometimes I'll be hungry earlier. Sometimes it'll be later. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are just little things that I personally did. I don't know if, you know. No, anyone, that's, 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 so yeah. the, um, developing the taste for healthy food is again, another one of our pillars. Okay. So when we've, when you're used to eating those foods that have actually been engineered for you to crave them. Right. And want more. And that's very true. I've seen it's, specials oh, on this. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's real. It's, it's, you know, these, these people work in a lab to have the crunch and the salt yeah. and the and the, the sweet so that it triggers our brain in a way that drugs do. It, it's exact same thing. I really I, yeah, it, I saw it the is, special. I'm sure you, I was like blown away by like yeah. how detailed these these um, the ones I was watching was on snacks. Mm-hmm. These different kinds of snacks mm-hmm. and they're literally engineered to make you want another one. They are. They are. Which is a little bit scary. No it is. To it's, me. Well, people are getting sick. Yeah. You know, so I mean, that's what we know is right. that people are buying the 99 cent snacks, right? And they're developing type two diabetes, right? They're developing, like I said, these these other digestive diseases yep. that we didn't have 
before. That's so, true. Before the age of processed food, we were right. actually healthier baseline, which we, is interesting. Well, we had we ate whole food ingredients. People right. had to cook things, and if you didn't cook something, you found somebody who would cook something. Right. So you know, and and we ate a lot of soups and stews and things like that that you could really just put together. You know, what you have in your house and make something out of it. And if you were fortunate to have those herbs and spices that you can also use to make it delicious, right. then you, th- I mean that's what we ate. But then we had World War Two when we mm-hmm. had you know everybody. Uh, we had tens of thousands of people that we needed to feed in, you know, out on the battlefield. Right. There was no refrigeration. There was no real easy way to, to be preparing the food for the masses in yep. that way. So we developed, had these technologies to develop these processed foods. Yeah, like M&M's. <laughs> That's <laughs> like true. That's one of the things they sent out. M&M's was like sent out because it had the coating was to yeah. send it to battle. Yeah. <laughs> It was. Oh, no, seriously. I believe it. It so, is. You know, I mean, the, the, so with their hands there's get probably on. a good reason for, you know, why we did this <laughs> to begin like, with. Everybody eats them. <laughs> so. But now, you know, so, and then after the war, we were like, oh, we have these all, these yeah. conve- convenient foods. Right. Let's sell them to, to, the, to the public. And again, they're cheap. True. And people, you know, the, the big um, food companies were making a lot of money on them. So, so that, that's where we... Um, you know, we we need to really go back to those whole food ingredients, um, and and work with foods that don't trigger us, right? And and like you said, okay. am, am I hungry or am I thirsty? It takes about twenty to thirty minutes for your stomach to tell your brain that you're right. full. Yeah, there's a lag there. I know yeah. for sure. Yeah. So you know, so giving yourself time after you've eaten to see if you really want that that other helping. Same thing with you know when you start to look at how foods make you feel. That how right. you feel is data, and how it works with your biological individuality. Once you realize that you eat that piece of cake, and three hours later you are ready for a nap in like right. in a really like a big way. True. And you can't afford to do that. You may not want to do that. The other thing that we see where, you know, a lot of us have a job where we can decide we're not going to eat till 10. But when you're dealing with people like nurses and teachers. Yeah, they have set breaks and things. They yeah. have. It's, it's yeah. such a challenge yeah. for them to be eating healthy because yeah. so many times they will just grab and eat whatever they, they can fit in their, their pocket. They will be like, oh, we need you they back don't. right now. And exactly. They, have, uh, they yeah. don't. And teachers and, and nurses are the highest rate of bio, uh, um, the uh the bio oh my goodness what is the word not biometric the you know the the bariatric surgery oh, the, the bariatric oh, really? surgery yeah oh my goodness yeah yeah because they really don't have control over their their um their schedules and they are constantly having bagels and pizza well, and donuts and muffins in the break room yeah because it's all readily available so you mentioned in the la- earlier segment that uh, part of this because we're all busy, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like you want to eat right, yeah. and but most of the stuff that's good for you starts essentially from scratch because it's whole food, right? And you have to put it together, make it somehow, get it made. Well, but if I but I'm, if I'm working five days a week and I have like two or three kids running around, yeah. I got to get them to school, yeah. and I have a spouse that's off to work, or mm-hmm. I'm off to work, or we're both off to work. Um, <clears throat> how do you fit all that into your day when if when you feel like all you want to do is just grab something, unwrap it, and throw it in your mouth? So I love frozen vegetables. Okay. I think frozen vegetables has helped me get food on the table in a really short amount of time that a lot of other, you know, if I have to prepare the, the food myself, it's not necessarily happening. So again, it is planning, right? It's, I mean, right. It's, it's not easy, but if, it, if you make that a priority to fuel your, your, yourself and your family in a way that is, is healthy, right. You, you know, you, you can figure it out, and it doesn't have to be fancy. Right. Like, I mean, we, we also do a lot of cooking demos where we show people how easy it is to put together a saute. Like, right. I do a lot of sautés. So you, you name your protein, you know, whether it's a chicken or, or tofu or whatever ground, whatever you want it to. Right. And you just saute it in some olive oil, garlic, and, and onion, and then you can add some bags of fro- frozen uh, chopped vegetables, do different seasonings depending on what it is that you're making. I mean, like I said, I do a lot of sautés, so if right. I'll use sesame oil and then some other Asian spices and a lot of cilantro, and that's my Asian stir fry. I'll do the same thing, only I'll add chili powder and some other spices, and that's my taco, you know, Taco Tuesday uh, sauté. You know, same thing with adding a lot of vegetables to a pasta sauce. So, so I'll add. Um, I when I was doing my panic pre-COVID grocery shopping, 
And <laughs> you, you and a couple billion other people. I know. And so I'm in the frozen food, food aisle, and right. I'm looking, and I'm like, there's nothing left, right? I'm there's, sure. There was a bag of chopped, frozen chopped collard greens. And I was like, all right, well, I guess this is what we're eating. Because okay. That's, so, and I added it to... Whether I guess it was maybe a, a, a Taco Tuesday things, you know, right. saute. I add it to everything now because oh, it doesn't really change the flavor, right. you know, profile, but it gives you the fiber and it gives you the dark leafy green, so you get the micronutrients from that. And you know, it, it, like I said, it doesn't really change the flavor. So I'll add it to a pasta sauce. I'll add it to a, a, an Asian stir fry. I add it to a lot of foods just to boost the nutritional value of it. Right, and then also. Making enough to have leftovers. You know, I know a lot of people say, oh, I didn't do leftovers. I'm like, I live on leftovers. Like, I have leftovers for breakfast all the time. I have leftovers in my freezer. Um, you know, so so it's planning. If you're going to be making a meal, plan to, you know, try and make two. And yep. then just easy, 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 easy recipes. If they're, they can't be complex. I mean, baked chicken thighs. Right. You just, I call it like the, you bake the crap out of them. You just bake take the it, crap you just put them in the <laughs> oven and you wait until it's like they're nice and crispy yeah. and they're delicious, you know? So, but it's, it's easy. So, you know, but it's, it also, I know people have a challenge with what their kids will and won't eat, but they also do tend to mirror what they see. So that's true. So some of this is just training and learning how to make, cause you, you always hear these things where there are simple recipes that are good for you. And I think if people are used to just, you know, pouring out a box of cereal and throwing milk in and yeah. eating it, then that's really what they know. But it's like, it's really not that much more difficult. It's It takes only, because I, I, and I don't make, I'm not, I'm no gourmet cook by any means, stretching the imagination, but. Neither um, am I. I mean, I'm a, I'm a cook. But you put two or three things together <laughs> yeah. and you either bake it or blend it or whatever, and it's done. Yeah. It, and you're talking a couple of minutes. And if you use fresh. Most, Fresh right, herbs, it's better. fresh herbs, just like boost the flavor. And yeah. every single urban spice that we eat has a medicinal value. Every single one. Right. So adding them to your food not only boosts and, and livens up the flavor, it really does fuel us um, in a meaningful way. So it's, but it, it, it really, it is planning. It is experimenting. Um, but it is uh, just, you know, trying not to make things more complicated than they right. need to be. And looking at making sure that you have a clean protein, you're using the healthiest fats that you have access to and can afford, and making sure you're eating plants because that's the fiber. If you're not eating plants, you're not getting fiber, period. And when people talk about the convenience of a cereal and milk, right. I look at the what's in our cereals, which yeah. are super processed foods, yep. and they're basically human kibble. Human kibble. Okay. They're human kibble. <laughs> They're sprayed with vitamins that yep. our bodies don't even absorb. Right. Agree. Well, we're going to take another quick break. Um, you're listening to Master Your Finances. Welcome back. You're listening to Master Your Finance. I'm here with Marion uh, Reinson, and we're talking about eating healthy. Yes. And just before the last break, um, you actually said that cereal is like human kibble. And which, I'll tell you a quick story, which is not directly related to humans, but... Um, we have a lot of dogs. We have six dogs at home. And one of them was getting, like, they were starting to get things like, you know, allergies and, like, they, the paws were getting all funky where they would scratch them and they licked and this kind of weird thing's going on. And we kept changing dog foods. And what we found out was we'd, we'd go buy a good brand. It would get sold. They would change the formula. The, the, then it wouldn't work any longer. So we gave up after a few years. And we had this one thing where we couldn't find out. Our, our One of our dogs, Mickey, is now, I guess, 15, he was having these, um, like he would like pass out. He'd have these like um, episodes where he would like, with, with, well, first time it happened, my wife thought he died because oh. he would like went limp. And then, you know, a few minutes later, he'd come along. Nobody could figure out what it was. Spent many, many let's just say a lot. Uh, invested okay? a lot. Let's just say a lot, you know, <laughs> a down payment on a house kind of thing. Uh. You know? so, so we tried to figure out, we couldn't figure it out. So we said, let's just change the diet. So we started actually making our own organic, natural food and researched everything that's good for the dogs. Mm -hmm. And literally put it all in there. So they get salmon, they get, you know, beef, they get turmeric, they yeah, get yeah. all kinds of vegetables, they get blueberries, you name it, anything we could come up with. Anytime my wife, because she's a dog trainer, so anytime she'd find something that was good for them, she'd go, all right, that's going in the formula. So, and they're all extremely healthy. And so we actually spend quite a bit of money on the dog food, but we spend almost zero on the vet. Right, right, so, right. So, just from a pure economic standpoint, yes. it's insane how much healthier the dogs are than they were. Not that they were sick, right? 
it's just they would have these weird things happen right. um, that we couldn't explain. You spent all this time on these testing and things like that. In fact, we had one dog. And the other thing that threw us was we had one dog who passed away early from uh, – he had these like internal growths, and so we were like, and he was only nine. And our dogs typically live quite a while, mm-hmm. like at least twelve to fifteen years old. Okay. And that kind of that was, I think, it was kind of that plus the episodes was like, all right, we're done. We, we don't, we're not going to rely on third parties. We're just going to go ahead and manu- make our own stuff. Mm-hmm. And so that really kind of elevated our personal stuff. Was like, well, if we're doing that for the dogs, right. I guess we should really pay attention to our own diet even more. So, so the uh, ironically, the dogs kind of led the. The, uh, the 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 movement, not that they were, we weren't always thinking about it, but that was kind of like, all right, this is really pretty serious. And the other thing that I learned about over the years, which I guess, guess was talked about, but but I guess they're researching it more and more, is the microbiome and how like basically if your gut is healthy, right. everything else stems from that, which actually makes a lot of sense to me, just sure. anecdotally. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. If everything in your, because that's where everything's kind of processed and starts and the nutrition comes out. And, you know, that's kind of where the whole manufacturing process for what we're doing is going on. And the more I thought about that, I go, that actually makes a lot of sense. So when I'm eating, I'm attempting to, on, on my good days, and there are bad days. Let me. Let me we all let me, have them. Let me, let, me, let me be straight about that. That's we. We I'm also no talk about. Any means. We talk about non-judgment. <laughs> That's another one of our pillars is non-judgment. I, I definitely have my off days. There's no question about that. Sure. But on the you know the majority of the time, I'm thinking okay because I know if if I feel better, it actually makes you feel much better, right? Right. So that's the interesting thing is, is over. It takes a while before you figure that out and before you notice it. But you definitely notice it over time. You have a higher energy level. Mm-hmm. You actually sleep better. Mm-hmm. Um, everything it, works better. Everything. And, and so anyway, that's that's my little story about the dog. So I know it's not related to humans it, but it directly, is. but, it, but it I is. think we follow the same kind of it's profile. about It's about the caregivers taking yep. better better care of those they're caring for than they often do for themselves, right? And that's the problem. We, can, we have almost like too many choices. Well, like if the choices were you can only eat the like like, you know, back in the farmers 200 right, years ago. Right. You had to go out and grow it. Right. You know, <laughs> or raise it. Right. And, and I mean, that's that what, was it. You had three choices. They were all the healthy. It, that's the way it was. And, you know, in, in the from the 40s, you know, so, yeah. yeah. So it's, now you go to Uber Eats and you can have anything in your house within a half an hour. You can. You can. Anything, pretty and, much. Right. Right. But should you? Should we? Right. right. That's There's the that problem. should word. That that's should the word. Problem. So one of the things that you also said was. So, yes, the food might be more expensive, but we are saving money in other ways, right? right. Or it's it might be more expensive, but we are healthy. Correct. So when you become ill, it's not cheap. Yeah. It's not cheap. And when you look at things like eczema and, you know, like a lot of these, these – um, different health issues that people have a lot of it really is food related and it might be something that yeah. is could be healthy for me but not healthy for you so identifying what are the triggers that cause you to um, have your dis-ease right like right. so so the the story with the dogs is is just you know it's the same model with humans when you make the decision to eat in a healthier way, a lot of the issues that you were having goes away, the inflammation. And then when you talk about your gut health, so your gut starts from your mouth to your anus, and basically it's a tube that runs through your body that's from your brain and touches every single one of your organs. So if your gut is not healthy, then chances are there could be an issue with one of the other organs in your body. So, and our gut needs to be fed with the good bacteria so you know we um have there's trillions of bacteria in our bodies and when you're not eating the food that is feeding your gut and you're not eating the food that's really fueling your body which are your your um, macro um you know your your plants and basically your plants are feeding your your gut um fermented foods almost every culture has a fermented food they have a yogurt or they have um, pickled vegetables or, you know, different yeah, fermented foods. Why don't you delve foods. into that a little bit? Why are fermented foods like a good thing? So, so just it's again, it's the bacteria. Yeah. So yeah. when okay. you, so my foray into sauerkraut, who there knew? I like right. sauerkraut. Like I, I just, do. you I know, too. and it's one of those polarizing. I'll get better now that I it's good for me. Well, so just don't, <laughs> don't heat it because you'll kill the bacteria. Oh, all right. Okay. So you want it at room temperature. So I kind of always like crave sauerkraut when i was younger okay and now i'm like all right i kind of get why i also like pickles right like you know fermented pickles so 
So our bodies, have, you know, need bacteria to process all, all like the, the food in our system. And when you have those hyper-processed foods, the bacteria that are being fed are not the good bacteria. They're, mm -hmm. they're a bad bacteria. So you need to feed your body the good bacteria so that it can compete with and overtake the bad bacteria. And again, what you eat matters. That's so, true. you know, when you're eating food that if you're not getting enough fiber and the food is taking a while to be digested through your system, it's fermenting. Okay. And that's when you get bloated. That's when you get gas. That's when you, you feel dis-ease in your digestion is when your food is not really being digested properly. And it needs that good bacteria to do that. So okay. feeding your gut with... Just a little bit. I mean, one thing that we know is that bacteria likes to grow, right? It likes True. to, and it, 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 it will, um, you know, replicate whether it's the good or the bad. So mm -hmm. feeding it the good, just a little bit at a time, just a fork full of sauerkraut or a, you know, two ounces of a kombucha or a yogurt is, is you know, fueling and feeding your gut in that meaningful way. And then the um, probi the prebiotics are the leafy greens that also are providing those those uh, good bacteria. So when we are when people are placed on an antibiotic, yeah, you kill them. You do. So you need to feed <laughs> them again. Part. You need to feed them again. Right, so you that's you know, that you are killing the biotics. You are killing <laughs> you are killing the bacteria. So so making sure that you're 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 yeah. replacing what right. you just killed off. Right. And and just looking at it as, you know, as, as a supplement, like I look at certain foods as supplements. So yep. um, so your um, the fermented foods, that's a supplement. A lot of our tinned fishes, you know, like our sardines right. and salmon, um, they're you know, they're also that's that's a supplement. Right. There's so much to them. Our nuts and seeds. It's a supplement. So many of the vitamins and minerals that come in the bottles, we don't absorb. What mm -hmm. we're doing is is creating really expensive urine, right? <laughs> and when I look at people like, well, should I buy this? I'm like, just eat better food, and it's you know your body absorbs it, and you know that it's it's you know it's able to to get the nutrients out of the food. It's not able to get the nutrients out of you know out of out of a pill, right? Yeah. And you mentioned briefly um, the inflammation, which I think is a yes. huge issue. It is, and I don't. I, I think we underestimate most of it just how important it is to prevent inflammation. Yes. I mean, I, I, I look at it as like, like would it, well, I know some people have EVs, so forget the EV owners, but for people that have an, an internal combustion engine, if you took the oil out of the car, how long is it going to run? Like if you, if, you know, you have the heat and you're going to rub everything. And so inflammation in your body, it's like, it could be everywhere. It can, Literally. It, every it, part of your body. Inflammation is what causes the disease, right? So, right. I mean, inflammation is what a tumor is. Inflammation is what diabetes is. You know, inflammation is like all of these, uh, you know, digestive disorders are all inflammation driven. And one thing that we know is that sugar fuels inflammation. Right. And so if you're going to look at ways to reduce inflammation, it's really looking at where your sugar comes from. And if, if for everybody that's listening, if you just remember one thing about what I said is that four grams of sugar is a teaspoon. We don't, as Americans, we usually don't think in terms of grams. Mm -hmm. But a 12-ounce can of Coke has 39 grams of sugar, so that's almost 10 teaspoons of sugar in a can of Coke. Oftentimes, there's 16 grams of sugar in a little cup of what I used to think was really healthy yogurt. Right. And now I look at my sugar, and it's like if I'm going to have sugar, I'm going to pick out where it's going to be. And it might be in something that's delicious and a small serving of something, but I'm going to choose it. I'm not going to get it out of other food products that are in, like sauces or, or dressings or things like that that are filled with sugar and are can call that's what fuels inflammation same thing with a lot of the oils right. that are used in restaurants so you know the canola oil is shows up on like the naughty and nice right. list all mm -hmm. the time and you know some people won't ever use it again it's what you can afford and canola is a, an affordable oil it's better than some of the other seed oils that are out there but the way we cook in our home kitchens is not the way that the oil is being treated in a restaurant so if you're eating out at restaurants a lot, you have no control over what's going in your food. You don't know how much sugar, you don't know how much salt, you don't know what they're doing with the oils, but oftentimes they're heating them to a very high heat and reusing them over and over and over, which is what creates inflammation in our body. So everything, every dis-ease that we deal with is usually inflammation driven. And if you can figure out how to reduce those foods that are causing inflammation, we know sugar is one of them. Right. 
then that's going to help. Well, thank you, Mary. We appreciate you coming on today. You're listening to Master Your Finances. You can uh, like and subscribe going to masteryourfinances.us. Uh, thank you very much.